Hi, my name is Luke Davis. I am the producer here at Foundry 42. I look after the ship, environment and UK tech design departments. Here at CIG, the ship pipeline has seen a remarkable evolution. Before I got here at Foundry 42, we were still outsourcing um, ship assets to various companies to uh, finish the artwork that we didn't have the capacity to do um, in-house at the time. And it proved that we had, there were very various issues that came along with outsourcing um, an art asset. One of the biggest issues was the, the communication breakdown between the various departments. Um, so whereas now we have the absolute luxury of being able to have um, various departments and disciplines within the same studio, specifically the, the art director, the art team, and the um, tech design team all in the same building. Whereas previously what we had was a tech design department in Los Angeles. We had a art team here in the UK and we used to outsource um, ships for concept and um, the 3D assets. Um, to another company. Um, what we now have now is an official design document that our tech design team, both in LA and um, the UK, um, sign off on and sort of go, right, this is how many thrusters it should have. This is the exact animation template it has to use. And this is what weapons it should be using and sort of give an idea on roughly what the ship needs. It's minimum requirements, not to define the shape or you know how it should work, it's just what should be in it. One thing I really like about uh, the process here at, um, at Star Citizen is that they kick you off with, um, with a 3D kind of cheat sheet of volumes saying, we need engine size to be roughly th this particular uh, cube. We need a, a gun to be this size. They, they want to make sure that as you start thinking about it, you're kind of aware of what the, um, what the different shapes are and what the different proportions are. And that really helps me out because when I start a design, after I've looked at um, reference and the past ships and thought about myself on course design-wise, I'm gonna go in and I'm gonna begin with a sketch pass. And that's my thinking pass. You know, when I have a pencil in my hand and I have paper in front of me and I'm just noodling and drawing, that's when I'm really getting my head around what I want the design to be or how it should balance or, or what the proportions could be. And so in, in my first physical pass with the, um, with the Buccaneer, I did a kind of big cheat sheet that was basically uh, kind of pared down to the most simple components. Engines, cockpit, guns, wings, you know, let's move stuff around and um, let's kind of see if we can get a feel for it. So one of the challenges of the ship being in the concept phase is not just to make um, a pretty ship, it's to make sure that it works for what we want in the game. So you know, you, you'll take what design wants, what Chris originally um, envisioned for the ship, and try and turn it into some sort of image. What tends to happen when we get a concept into production is we're handed a series of images that have been finalized, final paint overs, um, and just beautiful illustrations. In addition to that, we also tend to get a concept model, which is what the artist used to paint over and do his final renders. To actually make that usable, we tend to have to rebuild that model. Uh, we can't just, I mean, we can technically take that and put it directly into the game, but it would be very expensive um, because the concept models tend to not worry about poly count or anything like that. Um, and also, it wouldn't conform with some of the technology that we're using. So we essentially have to just rebuild that model. Uh, but in most cases, we're not just rebuilding the model, we're also making some changes along the way, uh, especially as we discover changes that we have to make due to the white box phase. As the concept guy, you're, you're used to getting the ball rolling, but then once the ball is rolling, you want that collaboration with, with the um, physical design team that's gonna be doing the, the actual 3D of the ship. You know, and you want, because they keep you honest, and then you also keep them honest in, uh, you know, they'll, they may kick an idea to you and go, well, you know, the engines are a little too close, we need to bounce, bounce, and then 
you'll say, well, I can do this. So it's sort of a, a really great back and forth, you know, that, that I think is really important to the process. One of the biggest issues that we have in concept is the actual metrics, because you have Chris on one side wanting to the ship to look a particular way. And as, the, as does the art director, the art director is constantly adjusting um, based on the feedback that Chris um, provides. And the biggest difficulty we have is trying to keep to the gameplay metrics that we need to work in the game, such as the animation template. Um, so animation have, for our current ships, they provide, for each ship we have, we have, there's a template attached to it. And we have to make sure now not to make any more templates, except when it's absolutely needed, and if we can use an existing one that works. So if we go, right, you know what, um, we would like the same entry animation as we did on the Gladius. Now try and use that entry animation on this new ship. How would it work? What are the challenges it, it, it comes with it? And it's just to make sure that everyone's involved in communicating with everyone what their new risks and issues are as part of that pipeline. So what we tend to do is we'll get the concept model if we have one, and we will essentially just build a very rudimentary version of the ship. Um, it doesn't have anywhere near the detail that the final model is going to have, but it serves as a representation for us to start playing around with gameplay elements. So when we, once we have this rudimentary model, we can throw that into the game super fast, and working with the tech design team, we can start actually adding weapons to it. We can start actually adding a rudimentary cockpit and have positions for the animations to work properly. So we can actually go into the game, walk up to this very blocky looking ship, press a button and then climb into it and start flying the ship really early on within the first week and a half to two weeks of production. And this is what we call the white box phase. For the design side of that, that's mainly just setting up some basic helpers and hard points. Get some thrusters on there, make sure it flies, make sure it putters around. And that's also when we do a lot of the initial placement for thrusters. So we, we need to make sure they're distributed evenly across the ship, that will be balanced, that's going to handle right and get the kind of performance that we want it to. So once the, the disciplines have had a look at it, and that's the main part of the, the white box, is that people look at it and go, right, I'm ready now. I'm ready for when the ship um, goes into production, or so it is further down the production. The UI team have looked at it and gone, right, okay, these are the, the, the they've done the metrics right. The screen layout is completely correct. We don't need anything new. We are good to go. The VFX department go, right, you know what? Um, the thrusters are in the right place, and the maneuverable thrusters um, are correct. Um, and know what type of um, ship items it's using, we are good to go as well. So then that's the main bit of the white box phase. And then it's handed back over to our ship artists and they just build it out and make it look fantastic during the gray box stage. And on the gray box phase, that's where the artists tend to do a lot of the heavy lifting on the geometry. So we'll actually start building very close to final geometry. Um, We'll start adding uh, bevels, or as Max uses call chamfers, all over the ship in order to use uh, custom normals on our, on our ships, which make it look as though it's higher geometry than it actually is. Custom normals is a technique that we use. Essentially, we, we call it custom normals, but uh, the geometry that we have, each vertices on the surface, um, has a direction which determines how the light bounces off the surface. So typically, there's a technique called subdivision modeling where you will, take, you will take a surface and an edge and you will sort of reinforce that edge by adding multiple loops to either side of where you want the light to bend. And that will give you sort of a nice flat surface on one side and then a crisp little bend and then a flat surface on the other side. So it looks really smooth. We really can't afford to add that much geometry because it makes everything a lot more expensive to do it with that technique. So what we do is we'll take the vertices and instead of reinforcing the edges, we'll add a single chamfer and we will then tell the verts to have their tangents pointing exactly where we want them to go. And that will give us the illusion of having a reinforced edge without actually having a reinforced edge. So it gives us a much cheaper asset in terms of geometry, but the quality is just as good. And it ends up making the ship look really cool. But that's essentially what we do in the gray box phase, is build as close to final geometry as we can using only two tones to break up the surface. So we'll have a light gray and a dark gray, or maybe a high spec value, a low spec value, just to get a basic breakup of the colors uh, and how we're gonna break it up on the exterior. We'll also do more finalized animations in this stage. So we'll go ahead and build full landing gear, 
and actually do the folding up and closing to make sure that everything closes perfectly and looks beautiful. Uh, and we'll do this for landing gears, we'll do this for ladders, we'll do this for the cockpit canopies. Uh, anything that moves on the ship is something that we end up animating within the gray box phase. Uh, mostly because we actually can't build the final geometry without knowing how it's gonna move. Uh, so it's really important for us to sort of work on animation and building simultaneously. Because when you go into gray box, you start needing to tech design, get much more involved. They have a, they have a working ship or you know, in white box form, and their, their, their job is then to go and make it flyable in the engine. And of course, it's only gonna be a flyable white box, but it's flyable nevertheless. And it's trying to make it work for all the other disciplines. The goal is at the end of the tech design gray box phase, is that other disciplines have something to work with. Once I get it back from there, it starts getting into more of the nuanced setup. So really getting the final thruster items hooked up and not just you know placeholder items. Uh, making sure all the guns are seated properly, making sure everything is functioning, giving the player the right line of sight, making sure they have uh, the right speed or convergence angle, uh, just all, all that real core tuning that starts to really build a ship out and give it its character. So we try to produce a ship thinking about the kind of experience and feeling that the player is meant to have. And you can really see this exposed in a lot of our bigger ships that have large interior environments. So some ships are meant to feel uh, very sleek and clean, uh, luxurious. So you'll have a lot of clean walls, a lot of brightly lit areas. Uh, and some ships are meant to feel really claustrophobic and unsafe. And the Caterpillar is a great example of that. It's dark, it's dank. Uh, there are a lot of sharp edges everywhere sticking out. So, we can also communicate that character with our animations. So one really good example of that would be the way, something as simple as the way a door opens. If you have a, a very smooth, quick movement on the door, it gives you the sense that everything's working properly. There's no mechanical problems with it. Whereas opposed, if you have a door that sort of jerks a little bit and looks like it's scraping across the side as it moves out, you get a sense that the ship's a little bit more dilapidated that kind of thing. So when we build ships here, we try to build our proxy animations to have some of that feeling in them. So if a landing, if it's a ship that's not meant to be perfectly smooth and perfectly refined, uh, the Buccaneer is a great example of this as well. We would like the landing gear to sort of deploy and sort of feel like it's dropping before it gets caught because it's, it's not a perfectly smooth transition. Uh, so that's, those are just a few of the ways that we try to add character and personality to the ships. One of the things that we've done really well with building out the Buccaneer is even you know, before the first white box was checked in, uh, Elwyn had been planning out a new, just a new way of laying out some of the files or uh, updating our, our current method of laying out the file inside of 3D Studio Max. Uh, that has really sped up the process on doing handoffs between art and design where, you know, uh, uh, an issue can be called out, okay, cool, the feedback goes back and forth, and I can still work, set everything up without ever having to worry about uh, their work, you know, overwriting mine or mine overwriting theirs. So it just removes a lot of roadblocks, and that way it lets us, even with any uncertainty, it lets us be agile enough to jump onto, you know, the Buccaneer or a, the Cutlass uh, or whatever other ship or task is coming up. Uh, when the time comes for it. The Drake Buccaneer is now considered Grey Box complete in the production pipeline. There are still many steps remaining before we can consider this flight ready, and we'll be back later when it is.